family, and welcome. We're Bob and Penny Lord. We're in the eighth century, and the church is under attack again. The state has always wanted to control the church. In this way, it could control its subjects. Now, if an emperor could discredit the pope and become the legitimate head of the church, he could ask any sacrifice of the people, and they would obey. The emperor uncovered a way to wage war against the Catholic Church. He aided and abetted a group called iconoclasts. They held that the veneration of all types of sacred images was idolatry. He accused the church of advocating the worshiping of images in place of God. Now, seven popes had either been Greek or Syrian when the Lord raised up the first Roman pope, St. Gregory II. He turned out to be a pope of the people. He supported the Italians when they rebelled against the unfair taxes imposed on them by Emperor Leo III. The government tried to have Pope Gregory II assassinated. And when that failed, they tried to have him removed as pope. The emperor came out with an edict by proclaiming the veneration of images a stumbling block for Jews and Muslims desiring to convert. He was able to get the church in the east to go along. The patriarch signed the edict, pro edict prohibiting the veneration of images. Emperor Leo III demanded Pope Gregory condemn the veneration of images or be forced to step down from the papacy. The pope not only refused, he condemned iconoclasm as a heresy and issued a warning to the emperor to stay out of affairs that are princes of the church, not of the world. The pope never weakened, no matter how many threats were leveled at him. Because the people of Italy had profound reverence for the successor of Peter, no harm came to the pope. Pope Gregory II died, and he was followed by a Syrian, Gregory III, who began his pontificate by carrying out what his predecessor had begun. He appealed to Emperor Leo III to cease persecution of the uh, faithful and clergy who were venerating images. Receiving no answer, he convened the Synod in November 731 AD, which condemned iconoclasm and excommunicated anyone destroying sacred images, including the emperor and the patriarch of the East. The emperor responding, responded by sending out a flea to attack the pope. If intimidation and threats wouldn't work, he thought, let's see how the pope stands up to force. The pope did not back down. Pope Gregory, St. Gregory III died and St. Zacharias succeeded him as pope. Now because of the battle over iconoclasm, relations between Rome and Constantinople had become strained. The new pope reached out to the patriarch of Constantinople, sending an announcement he was the new vicar of Christ. Where he, whereas he was showing by this action there was no break with the Church of the East, Pope St. Zacharias did not hesitate to advise Emperor Constantine that his stand on iconoclasm was in agreement with the former pope. Problems with Constantinople continued. The next pope, St. Paul I, defended the church's position on iconoclasm, and when there was a debate at a synod in 767, the veneration of images was upheld. Hadrian became pope and convened the Second Council of Nicaea. In September of 787, the council condemned iconoclasm and resumed the veneration of images, proclaiming, we worship God, we venerate the saints, and when we pray before images of saints, we are paying homage not to the image, but to the person depicted. Emperor Charlemagne not only went along with the condemnation of iconoclasm, he returned lands formerly confiscated from the papacy. Although Charlemagne and Pope Adrian were at loggerheads many times, when the Pope died, Charlemagne mourned his friend, quote, as if he had lost a brother or a child, unquote. And not only had masses said for the Pope and all the churches of his, of his domain, he had a monument carved to his honor as an expression of the esteem and love he had for the Pope. The Second Council of Nicaea cleared up the matter for all time, or so they thought, but the enemy never sleeps. Our ongoing tradition of venerating the saints and paying respect to them through their images came under attack again in the 20th century. The church fights back. Vatican Council II stated the practice of placing sacred images in churches so that they may be venerated by the faithful is to be firmly maintained. Nevertheless, their number should be moderate and their relative location should reflect right order. 
Otherwise, they may create confusion among the Christian people and promote a faulty sense of devotion. Pastors misreading this document began removing statues from our churches, discarding those of the saints as well as Mother Mary. And the result? The Blessed Mother, the saints, and the angels they represent were soon forgotten. Vatican Council, too, was not suggesting or ordering us to throw out all the statues of the saints and the Blessed Mother. Art has always been a means of graphically communicating God's message to us. We know the impact that television has had on the learning and unlearning process of our families. Christian art is called to reflect God the Creator. It has traditionally been for the education of the faithful, especially in the days when only the few could read or write. When this and the preaching of our priests was the only way the faithful could learn the Old and New Testaments, the life of Jesus and Mary and the place of angels and saints have in their lives. This is how the church taught her children. Could millions of mothers have killed their unborn babies if they had first looked upon Our Lady of Sorrows holding her limp son's body in her arms? When the statues of the saints left, the example of the saints left with them. And then we had a new set of heroes and heroines to emulate, only these were not with Christ but against him and how Jesus and his mother wept. The angels were no longer visible to remind us they were with us, that we are not alone. And we often despaired. They took away all evidence of our Lord and our heavenly family, and they left us with a new religion, empty promises and no hope. They had chosen Barabbas for us once more, and our Lord was condemned again. The abuse, this abuse of Vatican Council II regarding the veneration of sacred images has gone to such extremes that in some churches we have visited, there is not only Jesus missing from the cross, but instead of the cross, there are a series of metal pipes arranged in an abstract design that would have made Picasso proud. We as Catholics believe that the Mass is the supreme sacrifice. In the light of faith and standing on the words of Jesus himself, we know we will experience, quote, the unbloody repetition of the sacrifice of Christ on Calvary, unquote. There on the wall in back of the altar of sacrifice, where our Lord will once again come to us through the consecrated hands of the priest, what do we have before us to reflect upon? Archbishop uh, Fulton J. Sheen boomed at a very modern church, where have they hidden my Lord? What happened to the wood of the cross that they nailed our Lord to? What happened to the veneration we have given to the relics of the true cross for almost 2,000 years? Is there too much pain, dear pastors, as you look upon the price he paid for us? When you are selling the heresies of psychology and humanism, instead of bringing Jesus to the sheep you have vowed to feed, is the bloody form of the cross too agonizing a reminder of what you have been called to be? Victim priest with our Lord, the victim priest. As you avoid the passion, are you cheating yourself as you cheat your congregation? Can you no longer kneel before the crucifix and look upon his wounded arms, vulnerably outstretched before you, waiting for you to love him? Are you afraid if you look at him, you might turn back to him? I can remember a time when I had difficulty with Mother Mary as depicted in Michelangelo's Pietà. She looked so resigned to her son's death. I kept agonizing inside. Why did she not scream? How could she have stood silently by as they killed her perfect and loving son? And then we went to the Holy Land. I saw a statue of Our Lady of the Sorrows as I knelt at the 11th and 12th stations of the cross on Calvary. There was a sword piercing our blessed mother's heart. She was crying out in agony. Jesus' mother and our mother Mary suffered. Her immaculate heart was broken as she shared with her son in the redemption of the world. I was looking at a mother grieving for her son. That's when I began to discover Mother Mary. That's when I learned to love Mother Mary. This was the mother I could relate to. She knew my pain. She had suffered just as I had. The more I searched her heart, the more I loved her. That's when she became my mother, my sister, my confidant, the one I could turn to. I needed that image, that statue to open my heart and mind to Mary. Now, 
we'll talk about Waldensians. These are tools of the 12th century. Before we gave everything up and began our ministry, the parable of the rich young man would touch Penny so deeply, she would cry every time she heard it at Mass. Peter Waldo, a wealthy merchant of the 12th century, was also touched by that passage. Go and sell what you have and give it to the poor. You will then have treasure in heaven. After that, come and follow me. Waldo sold everything he had and gave it to the poor. By 1176, he had divested himself of all his earthly goods. This accomplished, he took a vow of poverty. Now, whenever someone is a radical sign in the world, as Jesus calls us all to be, there will be many who will see the light in that person's eyes and they will want it. At first, the townspeople probably took a wait and see attitude. But as he was consistent in this new lifestyle, before you know it, others flocked around Waldo. They too sold everything and gave it to the less fortunate. They took to the streets to spread the good news. The only problem was with little or no education in the church, they became self-proclaimed preachers and went off in the wrong direction. Peter Waldo believed the church was in need of reform. Evidently, Jesus felt the same way. He directed St. Francis to, quote, go and re rebuild my church, which as you can see is in ruins. It would seem we have another St. Francis here. Why did one end up a saint and the other a heretic? As we will discover throughout this series, the key word is obedience. Maybe, as with Francis, Waldo started out wanting to do good, but when we disobey and place ourselves above the church and her teachings, one error leads to another. The difference between Waldo and St. Francis is obedience. St. Francis worked within the church. He presented his rule to the Pope and waited for his approval. Waldo and his followers, however, went off the deep end. They began to preach the church should have no property. Now, it was one thing for them to preach poverty for themselves, but when they began to impose their beliefs on our church, that's when the Archbishop of Lyon stepped in, condemned the group, and threw them out of the diocese. They condemned the tradition of supporting the church by tithing. Now, we all know the church, right from the very beginning, has needed funds to bring Jesus and his word to the faithful. As no family can exist and grow without a roof over its head, without nourishment, without education, so it is with the church. As we journey through the centuries of our church's existence, we can see the critical necessity of education and evangelization, the passing on of the church's doctrines to all God's children. Those faithful whom the Lord has called to give up their lives and serve Him and His church in the spreading of the faith must be supported by the faithful who are part of the church but are not called to that walk. Each member of the mystical body has a calling. We're all called to different vocations in the church. No segment of the church can exist and grow without the other. During the offertory, we hand back to the Lord that which He has given us, because without Him, we would not be able to move our arm to give. The Judean Christian tradition has always included tithing. The Waldensians ignored the Pope's condemnation and preached in the Diocese of Lyon. They turned completely away from the church and embraced a form of Manichaeanism which had not yet died. The Waldensians threw out all but two sacraments, baptism and the Holy Eucharist. Each sacrament is a special and unique grace given to us from God. To not deny any one of them is to tell God we reject the gift He desires to give us that we might have eternal life. Either we are saying we know better than God what we need, or we just don't care about Him and His gifts of eternal life. The sacrament of baptism was given to us by Jesus when he told the apostles and consequently all the priesthood that would follow to go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Teach them everything I have commanded you and know that I am with you always until the end of the world. They accepted the church's teaching that the sacrament of baptism cleans us of original sin that through this grace we are made part of the family of Christ by virtue of Christ's death and resurrection, and that through baptism we become adopted children of God and heirs of His kingdom and members of the church He founded. They accept the sacrament, but not obedience to His church. Vatican Council II said, though bat through baptism we are formed in the likeness of Christ. 
Christ who epitomizes obedience. They accepted the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. The Church teaches that the Eucharist is the sacramental sacrifice of the Mass, where the same offering that Christ made to the Father, that of His crucified body and blood on the cross, is now being offered through the hands of the priest. The Eucharist is the real presence of Jesus in His body, blood, soul, and divinity. And, as St. Augustine said, when we receive Holy Communion, we teach in the Church that we do not consume the Lord, but the Lord consumes us, and we are changed. We all receive this special grace when we receive Holy Communion. How we cooperate with that gift from the Father is what makes the difference. How did the Waldensians cooperate? They accepted two sacraments, they rejected five. They rejected the sacrament of penance. In the early church, the sacrament of penance was known as a second baptism. The church possesses both water and tears, the water of baptism and the tears of penance. We see this all the time, don't we? In the beginning, when the love affair with God almost consumes us, we can center on no one or nothing but making God happy. But then the world comes crashing in on us and we begin to compromise. One compromise leads to another, and then before we know it, the compromises become sins against the God we so passionately loved. We have traded our original love for the empty promises of the world and its king. Because of the temptations and our human weakness, the Lord instituted a special sacrament of penance for the pardon of sins committed after baptism, and the Church has faithfully dispensed this healing sacrament through the centuries. Pope John Paul II said, to acknowledge one's sin, indeed, penetrating still more deeply into the consideration of one's personhood, to recognize oneself as being a sinner capable of sin, is the essential first step in returning to God. As St. Paul said, anyone receiving Holy Communion unworthily sins against the body and blood of the Lord. He who eats and drinks it without recognizing the body eats and drinks a judgment upon himself. Therefore, if we receive the Holy Eucharist without the sacrament of penance, we are either claiming we are not sinners, going against the word, or we are receiving unworthily as we are in sin and our sins have not been forgiven. Jesus entrusted this faculty to forgive men's sins, first to Peter, and through him to those who would follow. I will entrust to you the king, keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you declare bound on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you declare loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven. They rejected the sacrament of confirmation. Baptism is that part of the initiation into the church which is completed through confirmation. Therefore, by rejecting confirmation, they were rejecting the grace necessary to be a full member of the church. And in effect, they were rejecting baptism. It's obvious the Waldensians were not really well versed on the doctrines of our church. Whether it was willful at first or not, they wound up causing a tremendous amount of problems for the church, which took centuries to correct. The effects of confirmation are an increase of sanctifying grace and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, a seal placed on the soul which strengthens the confirmandi and empowers them to profess our faith and fight the temptations of the world as soldiers of Christ, not only on that day but for the rest of their lives. This grace remains with us forever, whether we tap into it or not. In these days of heresies and attacks upon the Pope, the true teaching of the faith, we certainly need to call upon the grace received on the day of our confirmation. They rejected the sacrament of matrimony. Jesus believed this sacrament so important that his first public miracle was at Cana at a wedding. Jesus raised the marriage contract between two baptized Catholics to the dignity of a sacrament. The two most essential properties of this sacrament are unity that is, one spouse, and indissolubility, that is, a contract for life. It really seems inconceivable that any reasonably intelligent group could reject an institution in the name of Jesus, which was so important to Jesus. We will never forget our marriage encounter weekend when the priest called us holy. 
when he said this is the only sacrament that comes to us directly from God, and that our sacrament, sacrament is a lifetime contract between three, the husband, the wife, and Jesus. It changed completely how we looked at each other and our marriage. We really believe that on that weekend we became disciples of Jesus through his church. We not only fell in love with each other once again, but we fell in love with Jesus and Mother Church in a new and more meaningful way. The Waldensians rejected holy orders. We don't find that unusual at all when you consider that it was the authority of the priesthood as manifested first through the Bishop of Lyon and consequently through the Pope and his council which condemned Waldo and his followers. Waldo rejected the Pope's decision. It follows he would have to deny the priesthood. We believe that holy orders is the sacrament of the new law instituted by Christ, through which spiritual power is given together with the grace to exercise properly the respective office. Jesus believed the priesthood was to be his sign, an everlasting sign of his royal priesthood in the world. It was so important to him, he so believed in his church and his priests, that on the night before he died, he gathered his twelve and showed them how they would bring him to the faithful until he returned. He entrusted to them, through their consecrated hands, the special grace to bring him in his body, blood, soul, and divinity to the faithful. The Waldensians rejected the sacrament of extreme unction or anointing of the sick. This sacrament is given to baptized Catholics who are ill, suffering from old age, or in danger of dying. It is to be conferred by a priest or a bishop. It completes the sacrament of penance. It wipes away any sins that unintentionally have not been confessed. In addition, it strengthens the suffering soul to unite his or her pain with that of Jesus Christ on the cross. There have been cases where the person was healed physically as well as spiritually. Something happens during this sacrament. When my father was dying, long before I knew much about the sacrament of the anointing of the sick, he asked me to remain with him while the priest gave him last rites. I was standing beside my dad. I cannot explain it, but at one point, I felt a pressure on my shoulders. It was as if some powerful hands were forcing me down on my knees. I can still remember the room filled with a sweet, almost overpowering love. It was as if we had been transported to another place. I knew God was there. I could feel a blanket of peace cover my dad. As they rejected holy orders, it's logical that they would insist that a layman without faculties could forgive sins. But listen to this, a sinful priest could not. These faculties bestowed upon a priest the day he was ordained are perpetual. They have nothing to do with the worthiness of the priest. The Waldensians taught that a priest's sinfulness negated the grace he had received on the day of his ordination. They claimed that a host consecrated by a priest in sin would not become the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus in the Holy Eucharist. Our church teaches that the validity of any of the sacraments are not based on the worthiness of the priest. This heresy was a rerun of a heresy of centuries gone by. The Waldensians rejected indulgences, fasts, and all the ceremonies of the church. It is obvious that they were not only going against the word of the Lord and the church of their time, they were throwing away 1,200 years of tradition passed down by Peter and the popes who followed him. Quote, the granting of indulgences is founded upon three doctrines of the Catholic faith, the treasury of the communion of saints, Christ himself, and the Blessed Virgin and the saints. Indulgences under the proper conditions are granted for the pardon of temporal punishment due for sins. They be can be gained for oneself or for someone in purgatory. The conditions required are going to confession and receiving absolution, Holy Communion, reciting the Creed, the Lord's Prayer, the Hail Mary and the Glory Be for the intentions of the Holy Father within eight days. The church fights back. Synods gathered and many councils were convened. Peter Waldo and his followers were condemned as heretics over and over again, but especially by the Third Lateran Council in 1179, with Pope Alexander III presiding. Cardinals and bishops came from the four corners of the universal church. 
the council called for the punishment of heretics, which included Albigensians as well as Waldensians. Peter Waldo and his followers were excommunicated. Disobedient to the end, they refused to accept the ruling of Mother Church. Not only did they reject her findings, they began using violent means to bring about their own brand of theology. When they effected the civil peace of the state, the government finally stepped in, and the Waldensians fled to northern Italy. They didn't remain confined to that part of Europe or to their century, but continued to spread their heresies until the 14th century. Even though they diminished in numbers, these false prophets continued to spread their poison throughout southern France and northern Italy, right up to the Protestant Reformation. The enemy of God couldn't finish off Jesus' church with the Waldensians as they were. They needed new ammunition, a new name, a fresh coat of paint. The Waldensians joined the Calvinist movement. And because the faithful did not know that this was an old heresy which had been condemned, this attack did what the others had failed to do. It pitted brother against brother, causing hurts and wounds, although long forgotten, still dishearten and divide. But Jesus is coming, and we will all be one. We met a couple on one of our retreats who had formerly been Calvinists, both children of Protestant ministers, who gave up families and friends because they know and believe that Jesus is present in this, his church, the one he founded. That all the separated brethren will return home, we know. This is the hope and assurance we stand on. Come home, our arms are open, we love you. We'll see you next week. Thank you, family, for watching. This is just one of over 200 books and videos available here at Journeys of Faith. Now, these are perfect tools for evangelization and give them as gifts for birthdays, confirmations, First Holy Communion. Anytime you think of a gift, give one of these tools of evangelization. Write us at the address on our screen or call us in the United States at 1-800-633-248.